everyone, my name is Dave and I'm the host of Xylogamoto, the channel where I'm on a mission to collect and review every English language release for the Master System, Genesis, Sega CD, and 32X. And to be clear, when I say English language, I mean releases from any region, not just the United States, which ends up increasing the Master System and Genesis slash Mega Drive libraries considerably. If that sounds interesting to you, I recommend you subscribe as I release a review once a week, and so far over the last two and a half years, I've looked at 31 Master System titles, 69 Genesis Mega Drive titles, 10 Sega CD titles, and last but not least, two games for the 32X library, with the review for Motocross Championship going up last week. A quick disclaimer now that the intro is out of the way, <laughs> I'm not going to go into too many technical details here, as there are far, far better channels to go to view videos talking about the merits of these devices. Seriously, go subscribe to Bob at RetroRGB and the My Life and Gaming guys if you haven't already to really get nerdy about this stuff. I'm going to try to focus more on actual games. Having said all that, as you can probably tell by the title and description of this video, today we're going to go in a slightly different direction. As I've mentioned, I'm sure, numerous times over the last two and a half years, I'm doing all these reviews based on original hardware. That's right, I'm not using a Retron or a Mega SD or a Mega SG or a Mister or EverDrive or any other modern way of playing these titles. Well, except for light gun games. Those I emulate because screw big heavy CRTs. Yeah, I said it. For those of you that didn't just rage quit the video and swear off my channel for life for that statement, let me explain. First off, if you enjoy gaming on CRTs, awesome. Also, to be clear, if you enjoy playing classic games on any of those methods mentioned or some other form of emulation, that's awesome as well. I'm not here to tell you how to enjoy your games. I really don't care, and I just hope you're having fun keeping the spirit of this stuff alive that would be otherwise lost to time. But for me, listen, I'm 41 years old. I'm going to be 42 in a few months. I grew up with CRTs, I played arcade games on them, used RF video on TV sets that didn't support composite, and even sold my first home computer so I could buy a PlayStation 1 and a 32-inch Sanyo from Walmart, and let me tell you, that thing was an adventure to bring home in my 1987 Crown Victoria. I also spent years working in custom PC retail telling people why they should get a ViewSonic over some cheap AOC and drooling over a 21-inch Sony GDM F520 that over $1,000, I'd never be able to afford even my store discount. Having said all that, and completely living through that age of technology, I don't get the nostalgia. It just doesn't register with me. I vastly prefer the huge, bright, high-res, and most of all, convenience that goes with modern LED sets. You can take your scan lines and your line blending and get stuffed. It's just not for me. As a result, what is someone to do when someone like me has these original consoles from 25 plus years ago and wants to play them on a modern TV in the best quality possible and not have to deal with any kind of input lag due to image processing in a device? Well, historically, the king of that realm was the Frame Meister, which I've used since episode one on this channel. And I've got to say, it was really eye-opening even playing something as visibly unimpressive as pro wrestling for the Master System using a Frame Meister versus those other cheap SCART to HDMI converters that are out there. Yeah, it was expensive at the time. I think I paid around $400 on Amazon for it. But I'd say over the last two and a half years of doing this channel, it's more than paid for itself as far as the level of enjoyment and hours of use that I've gotten out of it. Let's take a closer look. And this is my Frame Meister. And while it still looks pretty great on the outside, it does have some issues. For one, it's old. The Frame Master debuted in 2011, making it 10 years old as of the release of this video. It's so old that it's actually not produced anymore, with units ceasing production in 2019. I'm actually not sure if it was still being produced when I bought this one, but it was about that time, and thankfully before they doubled in price on the resale market. The second issue with the Frame Meister is that it's a Japanese product. This means that if you don't know Japanese, some operations of the unit might be less than intuitive, and as you can see by looking at the packaging in the manual, yeah, not much help here. This is also an issue with the labeling on the included remote control, which is of course only used for everything, unless you really want to use the buttons on the front of the device to navigate all the menus. Finally, due to it being a Japanese product included with the unit by default, 
is a Japanese wired SCART plug, which, unless you have Japanese SCART cables, you cannot use or else you'll blow everything up due to incorrect wiring. I don't know why Japan has a differently wired SCART connector than everyone else. I'm just going to assume it's an NTSC versus PAL thing and move on. But if anyone in the comments wants to explain, I'd love to hear it without having to Google it myself. Thankfully, with the FrameMeister being such a great product, all sorts of English-based fan sites sprung up around it to explain what all those crazy menus mean, and shops even sold English overlays for the remote to make it a bit easier to use, as you can see by my remote. And replacement, we'll just say European SCART connectors are available as well, so that you don't have to worry about damaging any expensive or rare retro gear. I was able to get my FrameMeister up and running with little issue, and while it's possible I might have missed some tweaks, I've been very happy with the video I've been able to capture it using over the years. Now, let's move on to the other unit we're focusing on, the brand new RetroTINK 5X. And this is the RetroTINK 5X, the latest in the series of RetroTINK products from wizard Mike Chi. The RetroTINK 5X is about the same physical size as the FrameMeister, just in case you have a specific place in mind for your unit, and you're thinking about replacing one for the other. One immediate difference, though, is that you'll notice that RetroTINK 5X has a European-style SCART connector built right into the unit, rather than using the socketed dongle that the FrameMeister has. So, if for some reason you wanted to use Japanese SCART cables, you'll have to either replace them or figure out if there's a way to convert them over. I'll be honest, I've never had a reason to research that, so I have no idea if that sort of thing exists or not. But for most people, having the built-in Euro SCAR connector will just make for one less thing they have to deal with. As far as the rest of the inputs go, the RetroTINK also supports Component, S-Video, and Composite, with the Component input sharing a jack with a Composite, similar to many televisions. If you wanted to connect a Component and a Composite device at the same time, you can't use a switcher for that, but instead you could connect a component to the, to the component ports and then use a SCART to composite converter and make your connection there. On the subject of component video, this differs from the FrameMeister, which utilizes a D-terminal port for that, meaning you need another dongle for component connections. One thing that the RetroTINK 5X doesn't have that the FrameMeister does is two HDMI inputs, allowing you to use the FrameMeister as an HDMI switch effectively. The button layout on the RetroTINK is vastly simplified as well, with only three buttons, as most option menus can be navigated in sort of a tree format, but still a remote is included for full configuration of the device as well, even though for the most part you really only need to use the output resolution button to, well, flip between resolutions, and then the cursor circle and enter button to change selections on the non-resolution option trees. Compared to the remote of the FrameMeister, you can definitely tell which of these two is more user-friendly. Although, a lot of that is because the FrameMeister remote is loaded with buttons to shortcut directly to specific options. Well, that's the physical layout of the box and the remote, and all the ways to connect things in, but what can you get out of the device? Well, briefly, just to compare the two devices, the FrameMeister, due to its age, supports HDMI 1.4 output and also DVI with HDMI supporting resolutions of 480p, 720p, 1080i, and 1080p, and then more flexibility when using a DVI connection, with the expectation that you're going to be using a computer monitor instead of a TV. I specifically mentioned the fact that the FrameMeister is an HDMI 1.4 device, because depending on the TV that you use, to get sound as well as video into the TV, you may have to disable certain features on the port that it's connected to. I specifically ran into this on my Samsung MU8000, and it left me scratching my head for a bit before finding the answer in a random forum post. The RetroTINK 5X specifically sticks to just HDMI 2 for output, but instead of just outputting in 480p, 720p, and 1080p resolutions, there's three variations of that 1080p output relating to a 4x underscanned mode, a 4.5 fill mode, and a 5x overscan mode which requires you to drop a few lines of pixels, but can be adjusted by the remote. Along with those modes, there's also, and this is key as it's a major departure from the FrameMeister, a 1200p mode that allows for a 5x properly scanned mode with no line drops, and most impressively, a 1440p 6x mode. Both of those will require a 4K TV that supports those resolutions, or a 1440p monitor to enjoy, 
But assuming you have one of those, this should be making you drool. For more details on all those output options and others that I haven't mentioned, definitely go check out the videos from the Retro RGB and My Life in Gaming YouTube channels as they are far better at that than I am, and I'm trying to make this less of a technical video and just be more about my experiences with both devices. Well, I've shown off both the FrameMeister and the RetroTINK 5X. Now let's talk about the final piece of the puzzle when it comes to doing video game reviews, the video capture aspect. When I started producing videos for Xylogamoto, my capture device was this, an Elgato Game Capture HD, one of their earlier products. I actually used this prior to Xylogamoto when I was just uploading videos to a personal YouTube channel that I've since deleted because they are horrible and terrible. I held on to this for a long time due to its analog compatibility with the PS3 that was dropped in future models, but it's great for 1080p 30fps capture from HDMI sources as well, and it's what I paired with the FrameMeister for probably about two years. Then for Christmas this year, I was given this, the Elgato 4K60 Pro. And while I'm not planning on doing any 4K captures anytime soon, it was nice to be able to do 1080p and 60fps. I'd never really gone outside of Elgato for video capturing purposes, as you can see here, but they're certainly not the only game in town, just the most prevalent due to their marketing towards the streaming community and expansion of other streaming-related products. However, the release of the RetroTINK 5X has changed that for me. With the new, to me, 1200p and 1440p modes available, I immediately went to explore capturing them with the Elgato 4K60 Pro, and it didn't work. And to be fair, that card is marketed as a 4K capture card and not a 1440p capture card, but I was still a bit disappointed considering it's Elgato's top-of-the-line card. So I started to look into other options, and I ran across a blog post from Bob at our RetroRGB, and he mentioned success using the Evermedia 4K Live Gamer. So I picked up one of those to use instead, and true to his word, the Avermedia 4K Live Gamer worked without issue. The software is easy to install and configure, and I was able to accept that 1440p input from the RetroTINK 5X without issue. And in fact, I think I like the Avermedia capture software better than the Elgato 4K software, which honestly I've never been too thrilled with after upgrading from the Game Capture HD, which uses a different suite. In doing more research, as one does when putting together one of these videos, Apparently, under the covers, the hardware on the Avermedia card is more powerful as well and simply provides better hardware performance with the capture process. Swapping over to the Avermedia card has just been great across the board, and I'd strongly recommend everyone looking into picking one up, even if you can't just pick it up from your local Best Buy. And if you don't mind Amazon, it was only $230 from there, coming in a full $20 cheaper than the 4K60 Pro as a nice bonus. Okay, so we've got two scalers and a brand new capture card that can handle anything that they can throw at it. Let's now do some comparisons using original hardware just to see what you would expect to get when playing through a FrameMeister versus a RetroTINK 5X. For this next section of the video, I'm actually not going to be doing too much talking and instead will just have the captured video speak for itself. I'm going to be capturing video from four sources, a Model 1 Sega Genesis with 32X attached, a Model 1 Sega Saturn, a SCPH 9001 PlayStation, and an SCPH 5001 PlayStation 2, all using RGB SCAR cables into the FrameMeister and RetroTINK 5X. Also, to try to have as close a comparison as possible, I'll be using the 1080p fill mode, aka the 4.5 mode on the RetroTINK 5X, as that looks pretty close to what I've previously done with the FrameMeister. So, let's get to it. For each of these games, I'll be including a minute of gameplay using each device with the FrameMeister and the RetroTINK 5X, so you can kind of see what's going on here.
Ready. Go. Now that we've seen both the Frame Meister and the RetroTink 5X in action on several games from different platforms, what do I think? Let's try to break it down with a few basic questions, with the first and most obvious one being, should you buy a RetroTink 5X? Well, I think this depends on a few factors, but if you don't already have some sort of HD scaler, be it the Frame Meister, OSSC, or something else, and you like to play retro games on their original equipment, but want to be able to utilize a modern 4K flat panel TV or a 1440p capable monitor, then the RetroTINK 5X is a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a little pricey, but let's be honest, if you're in the retro game scene, you've probably spent far, far more on other gear and games. I would just make sure before you jump in that your TV does in fact support the resolutions pushed by, by the RetroTINK, as even my fairly nice Samsung MU8000 only partially supports 1200p and doesn't support 1440p at all, so unfortunately those true 5X and 6X modes are lost on me unless I'm using my capture device on my PC. If you do already have a Frame Meister, then I think things get a little bit more complicated. Do you want to output and capture footage at 1200p and 1440p? Then I think you definitely have to consider making the jump. But if you don't really have a need for those higher resolutions at the moment, and you're happy with the performance you're getting from the Frame Meister with 1080p material, Mm, or, or maybe you use the HDMI pass-through abilities of the Frame Meister that the RetroTINK 5X doesn't possess. Then you can probably skip the RetroTINK 5X for now. However, just keep in mind that the Frame Meister isn't getting any younger, and its HDMI 1.4 limitations may cause you odd problems like I ran into. Also, as solid as a product as the RetroTINK 5X is, and it is, I can't state enough, might clearly put a lot of work into this, I'm sure there will be firmware updates coming for the RetroTINK 5X to further tweak and optimize the unit. So it would be understandable if you wanted to wait and see a bit until the software piece was slightly more mature. For me, however, I don't see myself ever connecting my Frame Meister ever again, and it's probably going to join all those others on eBay. For my purposes, the RetroTINK 5X fully replaces it, and I'm looking forward to capturing footage in 1440p mode, even if I can't pass it through to my TV right now. And there's features on the unit I didn't even mention which you might want. So, like I said before, go give the videos at RetroRGB, My Life in Gaming, and even Scarlet Sprite's take on the arcade applications of the RetroTINK 5X a look on YouTube to really get a more fleshed out look at this great piece of hardware. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, even though it's a little different than what I normally cover, and it was definitely more challenging to put together. As a result, I know there's a ton of videos on the RetroTINK 5X that are already out there, but I still wanted to contribute in my small way. Speaking of that, regularly scheduled 8 and 16-bit SEGA programming 
there will be a slight delay before the next video appears as real life is occurring. I'll be taking a bit of a trip next week, sort of a vacation, and as a result it might be a little bit before episode 115 hits, but I'm already working on it and I'll go ahead and spoil it here. Episode 115 will be a review of the new Genesis game, The Curse of Ilmore Bay from Second Dimension. So far? I like it, but I'm not sure if I love it yet. We shall see. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video, and remember, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!